Thank you. Um, okay, just so you know, we're, we're on record, so anything you say is recorded. And um, Nikki and our team at uh, Chichester and Portsmouth Community Training um, will we'll make this public for the benefit of other instructors later. So um, uh, Perfect. Just, yep. keep, just keep that mindful for everyone. Um, okay, so the plan was for no break. So if you need to exit the room for a minute, just <coughs> put yourself on mute and go and deal with whatever you have to do with, please. Um, uh, timings wise, as my email hinted, I haven't really got a clue how long this is going to take. Uh, it's going to take more than an hour, less than two hours is my prediction. This afternoon's group, of course, will get a much clearer direction from me because I'll have the benefit of delivering it this morning. Uh, if you've got a mobile phone, if you could please just turn it off so we don't get any interference. Um, if you want to take notes, please do. Um, but as you've already heard, you, you'll get access to this as a video later. Um, and finally, if you've got a question, there's no need to email it or message it. Just unmute yourself and interrupt. So we'll take questions as we go along. If it's something I'm coming to, I'll, I'll park it, I'll shelve it and, and, and politely say we're, we're coming back to that shortly. Um, but don't, no need to hang on to the end for, uh, for questions. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to start off really with just a quick look of where search patterns fit within the RWA scheme. So you're all RWA instructors and you probably know this already, but let's just remind ourselves whereabouts should we or would we be teaching search patterns to students? Um, we're then going to discuss datums and uh, leg length or search pattern leg length. Um, and we're going to have a look at our first search, which is a sector search. Um, and this is one I suggest some of you will be teaching. Uh, we're then going to have a look at what's known as expanding square, or some people call it expanding box. Basically the same thing, if you ignore politics. Um, and we'll have a look at how that works. Uh, so that's very theoretical, delivered by me. Then we'll have a quick chat about how you might deliver those two things practically. And, and some of you, I'm quite sure, have done already. And mm. Some of you may have been a student on a course at some point. Um, so we'll talk about how we're going to deliver that stuff. Um, and then we're going to have a look at area searches. Uh, I suspect the vast majority of you won't be teaching area searches. And as the talk progresses, it'll become obvious why. Um, but we'll, we'll have a, a briefer look at those because that's more for your knowledge. So you're, you, you've got a bit of knowledge in the bank in case you get quizzed with questions, but I don't think you're going to be teaching them unless you work specifically with search and rescue, um, RLI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we have a quick quiz because by then you'll have been listening to me for so long, you'll, 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 you'll have enough of my talking. So a, a quick friendly quiz, no assessment. Um, and then if we've got time, I've got a man overboard video um, which we can have a little discussion. It's a real video of a real incident, um, and, and, it, and it's not to tear apart the people who produced the video because it's quite honest of them to, to mm -hmm. have made it available, um, but it's an interesting interesting discussion point for instructors. So let's, uh, let's crack on then. So that's, that's the plan, so let's crack on. Um, so question to you guys, which, which are way courses, which syllabus or syllabi contain search patterns? Safety bow. Safety bow. Advanced. Ooh, advanced power. Yeah. Any more? A yacht master. Where else does it say in yacht master? It's me, it. Paul. Sorry, say again. It's Paul. Paul. Um. Whereabouts, which publication does it say search patterns for yacht mark? I'm not saying it doesn't, I just don't remember myself where that might be. No, it's, uh, I mean, I can, it's a long time ago. I can just remember uh, doing it. I'm not sure that it teaches it now or not. Uh, I'm, I'm not a yacht master instructor, but I can just remember doing it. Let, let me show you the places I found, and I, I, I'm only human, so I may have missed one or two. Um, the, uh, I found it in the advanced power, of course, which you just mentioned. Uh, I found it in the exam notes for the advanced power boat to competence. Um, uh, by definition, if, if advanced power boat courses contain it, it's something that might come up in an advanced power boat instructor course, isn't it? Um, I found it mentioned in the advanced pilotage course from the, the spot of trend here, aren't we? Um, from the motor cruising scheme. Um, I found it was previously mentioned in the offshore personal survival, and we'll talk about that in a second. And I have to confess, I'd completely forgotten it was in a safety boat call. So thank you to whoever said that a moment ago. Um, let's have a look at what it actually says. So this is a screenshot straight out of the powerboat logbook. Um, and here we are. 
search patterns. Um, um, it gives us a bit of direction. It says understands, and, and you're probably all familiar with these terms. We have knowledge of, we have understands, and we have can. Um, understands means a student needs to be able to explain to you and prove to you that they, they understand, that they could go away and do it. They don't necessarily have, have to have shown you it. Um, and if we look at that section in general, um, what else is in there? So we've got helicopter rescue procedures. I, I think we all accept that most students aren't going to demonstrate that to us, are they, on a, on a, on a course? Um, towing and being towed, it would be quite nice if they did get a chance to demonstrate it. So I would suggest that this information here tells me I need to cover it as theory to a reasonable level, and it would be good if they can have a go at it, but it doesn't actually lay down in stone that they must have a go at it. Uh, where else does it come into? So three pages further on in the advanced, uh, sorry, in the Powerboat um, uh, logbook and syllabus, I'm now in the advanced exam, and there's the word there, sector search. And in here it says, in particular candidates must know the responsibility of a skipper in relation to. So there's a slight difference there. In the advanced course, it says search patterns. So it doesn't specify which, which search. In the advanced course, so it specifically names a search. So it would seem to me only fair to our students that at this level we're teaching them a sector search because they may be examined on it when they, when they move on a few days or a few weeks later. Um, this is a screenshot from the motor cruising uh, handbook, the G1, sorry, logbook, G158. Um, and it says, let me just now got all your thumbnails over my screen. And it says um, knowledge of how a vessel may be asked. So it's a, it's a little bit less than we see in the, in the powerboat scheme. This is a screenshot from the uh, offshore special regulations, which is where we get the syllabus for the offshore personal survival technique. And it used to, in this section, it used to state search patterns. It doesn't anymore. It now just says crew aboard prevention and recovery. And it tells me I've got 30 minutes to teach that. Now, in my world, we do a few minutes on um, lifelines, tethers. And we do maybe 10, 15 minutes on physically how to lift a person on board. This is a theory, and that gives me another 15 minutes to kill. So I, I find search patterns slots into there quite nicely. The reason search patterns has been, is no longer stated in that syllabus is offshore racers are required to carry one of these devices. So theoretically, if everyone's wearing a personal layers, we're far less likely to get involved with the search pattern. Um, and as someone correctly said, uh, it also appears in a safe doing course. My apologies, I didn't, I didn't get a screenshot for that. So, um, sorry, sorry Bob. Can I just ask, uh, I'm interested um, in the Powerboat Advance scheme, um, how many advanced instructors that are here that um, do, as a, as, a gen, as a rule, teach a practical um, box search or similar? Uh, I'm just curious because it's, um, it, it's an understands, but I, I tend to always teach it practically. And I wonder whether that's a me over the top or a recurring theme. Well, well, Gary, that's a question I was going to ask you lot shortly, so thank you. Um, let's have a quick um, uh, uh, me from anyone that does. Me. Me. Okay, good. So there's, there's at least two of us. There may be some more by the end of this talk. Well, we'll see. Um, so speaking officially, the, the source data for search patterns is this thing here. It's called I am SAR. It's, it's not a document a lot of you will necessarily come across. Um, I am SAR is a collaboration between the um, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, and the Civil Aviation Equivalent. So it's a global, two global bodies get together to discuss how search and rescue is going to happen in the aeronautical and maritime region. Um, when it comes to uh, search and rescue, they produce three manuals. The picture on here is volume three, which is the one that specifically deals with search patterns. And if I was uh, managing search and rescue on a, on a national scale, this would be the publication that I would derive. So if I was working for, for HM Coast Guard, this would be the publication I would derive my procedures from. It's not a publication I'd expect our instructors to consult uh, because we're, for most of us, we're not teaching people that are part of a coordinated effort. So, so let's just think who we are teaching. Um, most of you, I suggest, are going to be teaching power boaters, but a minority of you may be working with search and rescue professionals. And when I say uh, search and rescue professionals, I'm, I'm talking about lifeboat crews, etc. They may be unpaid, but I consider them professional. So with these guys, when they attend a search, 
um, have got very good communications with the Coast Guard. They've got very extensive training and um, they're probably one asset on a scene of a, of a bigger scale. Why well, I'd suggest these guys might be your students, George and Mildred, you know, have lost someone overboard and they're not that hooked up with the whole national network and so on. And, and they want a chance at finding their family member that they've lost. Um, so I think we need to be clear that I'm focused on teaching George and Mildred a system that will work for them, accepting that some of my George and Mildreds may, may move on to something where they'll get a high level of training in their, uh, in their own job. So that's not that I'm going to contradict what the Coast Guard would do. Um, we just don't have access to the software and so on that, that they might be using. So we're going to start with, uh, with datum searches. If you're not sure what datum searches, that will become apparent in the next 20 minutes. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about, uh, or the first thing we're going to talk about is the datum itself. Um, so what is it? What is a datum? There's a question for you guys. Where the instant commenced. Yeah, it's a reference point. We, we need a start point, if you like, for our search. Um, and this is going to be on my, my pitch I'm going to draw in a second. This is going to be my start point. What might that datum be? Where, where might it have come from? Information that the uh, other crew members can give us, the skipper of the boat. That's where the starting point, where it all happened. Correct. So how, how might we know? Because, I mean, it's just imagine we're in open water. You know, it's quite vague. He's back there somewhere. Where, how might we know where that start point is? Right now. We yeah, can throw, a throw a boy out or something. Good. Okay, so there's, there's our two options. Um, so on the left, we've got the crew of board the boat have hit the man overboard function. Um, and it's recorded on a plot or recorded as a Latin long where the person went overboard. On the right, the crew on board the boat have chucked some man overboard gear overboard. So these, these are our two sorts of datums. Um, I'm going to talk about and teach them very briefly. So the, the Latin, I'm going to call it a digital datum because I think we're all, we're all working in, in a digital world these days. Um, so the chat's fallen overboard and they've hit the man overboard functions. That tells me man overboard functions going on. This is, this is a Raymarine screenshot, by the way. Um, there's the Latin long to where he is. So I could, I could pass that on to another asset, couldn't I? There's my um, range and bearing to get back to him. There's interestingly the, the time the chat's been in the water, or the time since we hit the button. Um, this is quite useful because it's very pictorial. You know, if I lose my bearing as to where I am in all the, you know, kerfuffle, um, my chart plotter tells me pretty, I can see it, right, great, you're pointing at him, Tell, tells me how to get back to him. What is the downside of the digital datum here that we're using? It doesn't take account of the tide. Spot on. So, so as, as time progresses, let's, let's imagine throughout this session that the tide is going from west to east, okay? So the tide's going this direction, the arrow's going. Um, as time progresses, my man's moving off down here, isn't it? So digital datum is very accurate in the early stages, as time progresses, it loses accuracy. Now, I would suggest as a bunch of advanced powerboat, yacht master instructors, et cetera, you would have the basic knowledge and skills to update that. So if, if you knew he was there an hour ago and knew the tide was going east for an hour, you could do a pretty basic EP and, and, and essentially work yourself a new datum. So that's the first thing to mention is a digital datum would need to be updated if it was gonna maintain accuracy. We've got here a very short video of uh, just for those that haven't used the manageable function, but I, I suspect most of you have, um, here's one in progress. Mm. So they're sailing along quite happily, minding their own business. Joe falls overboard, someone hits the MOV function. Let me just press pause for a second. So there's your man overboard. We can all see that that's roughly southeast, can't we? But there's the bearing back to him. There's the, the distance running on 17 meters. Um, there's the time. He's been in the wall for five seconds so far, or, or we correct that it's five seconds since we hit the button um this particular plotter shows you the tide vector so i know straight away which way is going and the black line i think is the heading and the blue line is our course over the ground so let's just run that for a moment so the crew are starting to react the boat's starting to change heading um i suspect you've all seen this in training let's just advance a little bit forward a bit more you know, he's now coming back, isn't he? Um, we'll just pause it there. We won't watch the rest of it, but you get the idea. Um, a very easy for a helm to follow way of getting back. 
So a digital datum, as I call it, that's Doug's name, that's not the, 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 the usual name, is derived from a chart plot or GPS. The other datum you guys mentioned just now was the visual datum, um, which is the man overboard gear. So we, we've got five bits of equipment attached there. I'm not really too concerned with the whistle number two, but I'd just like to talk about the other four bits very quickly. So first of all, what's this thing here? Damn boy. Damn boy. And what's, the, what's this bit on the top? Board flag. It is Oscar, isn't it? Man overboard. Um, some damn boys are a little bit cheaper and have all yellow, all red, but it should ideally be the right flag. Um, and this thing here is known as... Horseshoe boy. Horseshoe boy. Now, what is the purpose of the damn boy as opposed to the purpose of the horseshoe? You can see it from a distance off. So those of you operating on coded sailboats have to carry this gear. If you operate on a coded motorboat, you're not required to carry the damn boy. It's that bit there you're required to have, so three, four, and five. And the reason for that is the feeling is that sailors may sail away for a longer distance while they um, get engines on, get sails down, get spinnakers down, and therefore they need this, this thing. I mean, an, an ocean going damn boy has got four meters of height above, above water level, an, an inshore one might only be a meter. Um, the motor voters among you may well carry a damn boy, but it's not statutory, it's, a, it's an optional extra. Uh, the horseshoe, of course, is bright yellow and visible. And what does the horseshoe resemble? What other piece of safety kit looks a bit like a horseshoe? Sweet boy. Uh, yeah, any more options? Rescue slings. Yeah, helicopter strop. Yeah. What, what, what do you all wear every day that looks a bit like that kind of shape and proportion? Life jacket. Spot on. So, uh, of course, when we wear our life jackets folded up, it looks nothing like that. But as you all know, once your life jacket's inflated, it is similar size and proportions to the, to the horseshoe. And that's something we're going to use to make our life easier in a second. Because I would suggest if I can see a horseshoe at 100 metres, I'm going to spot a man in a life jacket at about 100 metres. If I lose sight of the horseshoe at 150 metres, I'm going to lose sight of the man in the life jacket at about 150 metres. I know it's not precise because the back of a life jacket is not so visible, but it's similar proportions and it's a tool we can use. Uh, we've got the light. We don't need to talk about that. We all understand what the light's for. And finally, we've got this thing on the end, which is... Drogue. Drogue. And what's the purpose of the drogue? Slow it down in, in the wind. So the thing's not blowing across the surface rapidly. So just to sort of summarize then, um, the big difference between the digital datum and the visual datum is the digital datum is going out of date with time, isn't it? Because the casualty is moving with tide, but the datum is not. The visual datum is hopefully moving at a similar rate to the casualty. So if you manage to chuck this gear overboard within a, you know, 10 seconds of someone falling overboard, and let's say they're, 50 metres away. If you can get back to this, then hopefully the casualty is still 50 metres away. Um, I, I should add to that, my own opinion is that the standard drogues you buy are not actually big enough to completely eliminate the, the, the drift by wind. Um, but we appreciate the two, are, the two are slightly different. So we said I said I was going to talk about the sector search, so, so let's get started. So um, if, you're, if you're aware of a slightly different version of sector search, don't worry, I'm coming to, to your version and I'll explain why, why I favour this one and, and so on and so forth. So we've got a data and we've got a start point. Um, this is my best guess of where the man is. So I've either gone back to that visual datum or I've gone to a digital datum. And if my digital datum is out of date, I've corrected my EP um, to the new spot. And if you've used the digital datum, you're going to throw your own horseshoe in here because we want a, a visual reference of someone we can come back to. Um, depending on which publication you read, some people suggest that the first leg of a sector search should go into the wind. And they suggest that because it's easier to drive straight into the wind than across it. Um, I don't buy that argument because you're going to go in all different directions anyway. Some people suggest your first leg should go down tide. I also don't buy that argument because this is my best guess of where my man is. If I think my man is down tight of here, then I should move my data to there and that should be my search starts. So because we're going to our best guess, there isn't any favored direction other than keep your arithmetic simple. And to keep your arithmetic simple, we go north. 
So how's this going to work? Well, I'm going to get David to sit in the back of the boat and David's going to be looking backwards and he's going to be looking at my visual datum at my, at my horseshoe. And I've got, um, uh, I've got Peter on the port side of the boat looking, looking in the, this quadrant out here as we go forward. Um, I've got Simon in the starboard side of the boat looking in the, um, out this side. I've got myself driving and uh, I've got David looking backwards. So what David's going to be doing, um, th this is a real man overboard here, so that's a real person there. Um, but I'd like you for the moment just to pretend it is a horseshoe in the water. So David, here he is, he's got a little bit younger, um, is watching the horseshoe. And David is gauging how well he can see it. And he's counting in seconds. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, et cetera. Or using a stopwatch, whatever. He's looking back, watching the horseshoe. And at the point that he determines he can see that horseshoe half the time, we have our detection range. So we're not going to worry about when we can see it only a quarter of the time. If we can see the horseshoe, which resembles our man, half the time, we're going to regard that as our detection range. So here we go. So we've got north. We've established this phrase called EDR, which you won't find in textbooks anymore. And you'll see why I'm going to refer to it shortly. Um, uh, he's established what EDR is, the range that we can see a casualty. So, so we're here. We've gone. Give, give me a number, David. Number between 1 and 30. Sorry, Doug, you're talking to me. Yes, give me a number between 1 and 30. 15. 15. So, oh, nice, easy to math. So we've gone north for 15 seconds. David shouted, that's me, I found my EDR, and I'm going to treble that. So we go for 45 seconds. But anyway, make a turn to starboard. It goes 120 degrees. And we make another turn. To, so this is enough. So, so, so just to clarify, we've gone 15. David's counted an additional 30. Helm's turned to 120. We've then counted 45. We're then going to be on to 240. Um, and somewhere coming down this leg, because it, it's nice and perfect here on the on the PowerPoint, isn't it? But somewhere coming down that leg, we'll discover we've got a bit of air. It might be coming down here. At the point we see the horseshoe, we just correct back onto it. And this is a fundamental key point of the sector search, is that every three legs, you come back through your datum, so you're correcting any errors. So we then carry on along the same format, 240 north, 120, 120, 240 north. So we have, every leg was at 45 seconds, which was the number we got from here. Um, and after we've done one complete circuit of the sector search, we have looked in this area quite heavily. And of course, this is the highest likelihood of our, of our casualties, isn't it? Because this was our best guess. So it's most likely he's here. We've also looked in some other areas. So if you imagine... Let's do the sweep here. So we're, we're looking around here, aren't we, as we're going up. All this area has been seen. And then we turn to starboard, and all this area has been seen. All this area has been seen, et cetera, et cetera. So we've done, we've done one complete um, uh, uh, pattern, and we haven't found our casualty. And we can all see that there's some empty spots, isn't there? It's possibly he was bang in the middle of here, and we didn't quite catch him. It's possibly he's in this area. It's possibly outside of mine, outside of my search pattern. So the next step is just to, to offset the whole search by 30 degrees. So instead of the headings of north 120, 150, uh, sorry, 240, I'm going to go um, 30 degrees up that way, uh, 150 down here. Uh, I have to apologize, my, my, my west is a little bit, imagine it's a white body, more forgiving. Um, uh, but that's the 270. So there's my second circuit of the same kind of geometry. Uh, so let's have a look. So we've done two complete circuits and you can now see this area has really been, really been searched very heavily, hasn't it? And in fact, a lot of these areas have now been searched three or four times because, you know, as we went up here, uh, or let's, let's imagine your man's here, as we went up here, this chap looking on starboard might have seen him. This chap looking on starboard. Coming down here, this chap looking on starboard. You know, it's, it's multiple chances we've seen him. If we get to this point and we've not found the man, um, we're going to have to start being a little bit clever. Do we think we've been unlucky and we should offset a third search pattern? And there is an argument for that. Or do we think he's outside of our search area? So I'd be asking myself, how accurate was my datum to start with? Um, 
you know, was was it 50 minutes old when I started? Another 25 minutes has passed now. Is it possibly outside the area? Um, or, 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 I, or I'm reasonably confident I'm in the right zone and therefore I just need to offset another 30 and, and try again. I'm going to assume for the moment that, um, that we think he's probably outside the area. So we're going to move on to a, a second sort of search, um, which is usually known as the expanding square, but some publications refer to the spanning box. It, it's basically the same thing. Um, we go back to our datum. So, so we accept he may be in that area and we've missed him, but we think he's outside the area. Um, and the expanding uh, square looks to cover a larger area reasonably efficiently. And this is quite a straightforward search to follow. We've got, we've got our leg length already. I'm going to use the same median I've already got. So it's north, east, south, west, north, east, south, west, north, and then I run out of um, slide space. But essentially, that was 15, 15, 30, 30, 45, 45, 60, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can see how easy the maths is. Now, this search pattern is, in my opinion, much easier to perform, particularly if you don't... My apologies. I've been asked you all to turn your mobiles off. I didn't do it myself. Um, this search pattern is much easier to perform if you don't train regularly because northeast, southwest, northeast, southwest, there's some, there's some logic to it. Always turn to starboard and every two legs add, add the leg length again. The downside of this search is we don't keep coming back through the datum. So on the sector search, we returned back through that datum regularly. If you remember, we went this way, this way, and every third leg, we corrected any errors. So let's, let's imagine for a moment, we've got a westerly wind. So wind's coming from this side of the screen. The reality is nice steer north by my magnetic compass due to leeway, I might actually do something more like that. I'm keeping a constant speed through the water, but the, um, the wind may accelerate me down here a little bit. Again, wind puts me off, wind comes up here. So you could find even after just that first circuit, there's, there's an error. We just have to live with that. We just accept the expanding square has some errors in it. But what it does is it covers a, a much larger area than the sector search fairly quickly. So hopefully those two searches are nothing wildly new for anyone that's done an advanced power or higher, because hopefully that was covered on your course, um, be it as theory or, or practical. Um, and I'm just gonna touch uh, on the term. Can I ask a quick question on yep. both searches? Yeah. Um, on a sailing boat, it's fairly obvious the sort of speed you're doing. If you're on a rib or a motorboat, are you, you know, slowing right down to do this? Or are you keeping the speed up to try and get back to the person in the water in, in the shortest possible time? How does that work? Right. So that's a good question. So let's start with the sailboat. You're going to do this at almost full speed. Um, so it's going to be sails down. Um, if it's rough weather, you know, and you're going up wind, big waves coming across the deck. But if you if your boat or motor at six knots, you're doing it at six knots or at seven knots, whatever you can go. On a power boat, um, if we step away from the professional world, away from the sorry, the search and rescue world, we're going to do it at the fastest comfortable speed. So if I, I, I if the conditions will allow me to drive at 20, 25 knots, then that's a fantastic speed to do it because you can cover a, a lot more area than the, than the sailing boat. There are things that would encourage you to slow down, visibility, um, conditions, um, and actually, you know, there are there are you know some conditions you just can't drive at 25 without doing all your spines in. Uh, in a moment, we'll see a table that the RNI use where they they pick a couple of speeds, and 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 that'll give you a little bit more inkling on that. But when I teach this practically, um, if the conditions will allow the boat to do 20 knots, I, I suggest the guys do 20 knots. It, that's in an open rib. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, presumably the same with a, a motorboat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same wheel. I mean, it, what you need is your, we described four crew there, didn't we? we? Described one guy driving, so he needs to be able to see a magnetic compass. That's fairly easy. We described the lookout on port and starboard. Um, you know, so they need to physically be able to see what they're doing. And, and there is a point when smashing through huge waves, if the, if the crew can't see it, their, their area they're looking into, you're going too fast. Um, and we've got to be mindful of, you know, not losing more crew and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, a little bit of terminology oh. now. 
Sorry, I've, I've just got a follow up on that. Yeah. Um, because I, I always teach the box search. I don't teach uh, um, in practical terms, not the sector search, because it's easier for people to take in. Um, but I always teach it at 10 knots and at 10 second intervals, because I find that's easier for people to calculate. Was there a reason that you used 15 um, particularly? I... The reason I used 15 was, was that was the number David gave me. So if you remember, um, I was hoping David was going to be awkward and give me something like 13 or 17, but he was playing quite nice today. Um, but that, that leads on to a good point. If, if he had given me 17, I'd have just rounded it to 15 or 20, make the maths neat. I don't know my 17 times table. Um, so we're going to come to leg length in just a minute, Gary. So we'll, we'll just hold that thought and we'll amplify that subject in a second. So a bit of terminology for you. Um, so I've used a term called EDR, which, as I've said, you're unlikely to find in a modern textbook. And you might think, well, why is Doug teaching us the history of search patterns? And all will become obvious, as I keep promising. But EDR is the expected detection range, and it is established by David watching a horseshoe. And when he can see the horseshoe 50% of the time, we've got EDR. And we've measured it in seconds. You could measure it in distance, but we measured it in, in seconds. An EDR is something I think your powerboat students can get their head around because they can throw a horseshoe in the water and drive away from it and count to 15 or whatever number. So that, that's the first bit of terminology. The modern term that you will find in most books, and this is what's used in IAM SAR, so it's what's filtered down through, through search and rescue internationally, and it's um, uh, master mariners are taught it and so on and so forth, is track spacing. The track spacing in EDR are very, very similar things. In fact, track spacing is two EDR. So track spacing is double what EDR is. However, track spacing is not derived from throwing a, a horseshoe in the water and, and watching it and counting. Track spacing is derived from a table, or these days from a computer. Um, so this is one that I think um, someone without access to those tables, computers could calculate themselves. This is one that you would you would need the computer, the software, or the or the table to to get. Sweet width. Uh, what sweet width? Well, sweet width and track spacing are basically the same thing in terms of uh, distance. And let's have a quick look at what what they actually mean. So, um, the search that's going on here is a parallel search. We're going to talk about that in about ten minutes. But just to explain, the search vessel has gone along this line here. He's gone off screen and done a U-turn. He's currently making his way down here, and he will presently do another U-turn um, and off this way. So we haven't looked at a parallel search, but that's what's going on. And uh, the sweep width is the, um, is the area they consider to be searched. So that distance there from the search vessel to here, that is what I've called EDR, isn't it? It's the the range we expect to detect it to be being at. Um, and the RNLI and all these other authorities call that sweep width. Uh, it's basically two EDR, isn't it? Track spacing is the distance between the different legs of a parallel search. And you'll notice that track spacing is the same as sweep width. So sweep width is the distance you can see doubled. Track spacing is the distance between the two um, tracks. It is exactly the same number. It's impossible for it to be two different numbers. It has to be the same. Has to be the same number. It's just being used slightly different. And you see how it relates to EDR. That that is two EDR. Um, so where do we get track spacing from or sweep width? Well, this this table is one I've I've unashamedly pinched from the RNLI. So this is in one of their training manuals, um, and they might go looking for a human, a sort of person in the water. They might go looking for a life raft, a small vessel, a large vessel. So they've got lots of stats. We're only, for the moment, we're only interested in the top row and down here. We're only interested in the person. And um, it's based on conditions. So they've pre-worked out, and this is all done on averages with, with a bit of safety margin. They've pre-worked out that in uh, winds of less than 16 knots, sea state of less than 0.6 metres, if your boat can do 20 knots, your um, uh, sweep width is 30 seconds which interestingly would have been Davis 15 seconds, wouldn't it, if he was looking at EDR. Um, and they've given us some bigger conditions and some different boat speeds. And down here, they've said, you know, if you can't do 20 knots, you're going to do 10 knots. Here's, here's some more figures. So uh, not only is this something the R&I have access to, 
but this is pre-programmed into their software. So the Coast Guard says to them, I want you to do a particular sort of search from position wherever. Uh, they use positions A, B, C, D, we'll come to that. Um, their software essentially has all this in it. So although, although sweep width and track width, sorry, although sweep width is derived from a table, these days it's derived from a, from a computer. Um, so what other terminology have we got? Uh, we've then got the search radius and we've got leg length. Um, and these are all similar terms. So let's get another picture up. Um, so this is just something we've already seen. So that is leg length there, isn't it? Oh, apologies again. Silent. Um, so leg length is from, from the point you turn onto a leg to the point you leave it. So that's leg length there, isn't it? So when you come down this leg here, that is one leg and that is a second leg, although you don't change direction. Um, and in my example, leg length is three times EDR. Uh, the search radius is uh, leg length plus EDR. So um, if a casualty was here, theoretically we should see that corner, shouldn't we? Because um, we can see, well, let's, let's come down this leg here. So we can see that area there, can't we? So the search radius is three EDR to make the um, uh, leg length plus another EDR of visibility. So this example, ser search radius is four EDR. Now, if you um, are a member of one of the lifeboat services, um, uh, you may be hearing some things I've said and think that's a little bit different from what you'd be taught. What they are, and I tend to work off is track spacing. So they tend to go one track space. So only two thirds of what I'm suggesting, but they, in certain instances, an unseen commander decides to go two track space. Um, so you can see where, where what I'm suggesting we're teaching our power boat is diverges very slightly from what people in a more professional, um, I use the word professional, in a more search and rescue orientated uh, situation would use. And, and those guys all speak the same language. They'll use the term track spacing and the Coast Guard allocates some search areas. So, you know, what do I say? George and Mildred have lost, lost a crew member overboard. They think they know roughly where it is. They've called it in a mayday. Lifeboat comes out. Coast Guard tasks them with going to a specific place, perform a specific search pattern, and he tells them, you, this is your track spacing. Use one track space or two track space. That's a little bit different from avoiding the delay in George and Mildred's getting on with some kind of search in the meantime. So that, that's why I see the, 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 the two differences. Um, okay, so before we discuss how we might teach that, any questions or anything so far? Doug, if, if, you, if you're involved um, with, with the search, with the, the professionals, presumably um, there will be a a cross type of searching so they might do a sector search whilst they task you to do a box search or something like that and they use different vessels to do different searches correct now let's just explain the reality here is the coast guard doesn't like to use um us a lot uh, we're considered i know you all go to sea profession but we're considered leisure boaters aren't we um, they don't like to use us a lot for what they see as fairly skilled stuff because they don't know what they're dealing with. They don't know how much practice we've got. So you, you've all heard um, the Coast Guard saying all vessels in the vicinity of St. Catherine's Point, you know, if you can keep an eye out for a suspected man overboard. What they don't like doing is tasking people that, to do specific tasks if they don't know how good we are. So when they, um, when they throw lots of assets at a scene, they may have a helicopter, even two, and they'll put those on searches that are quite far apart, so they crash into each other, and they'll um, they'll have you know one, two, three lifeboats. They may have the access to some merchant vessels, and they know these guys have got particular software on board, and they know these guys have got particular training on board. So they give them very precise searches. So to me, our our powerboat customers, if they could call the coast guard and say, "I've been conducting a, a sector search." This is where my datum started. This is my EDR length. The Coast Guard can replicate that on his computer, but he will, when he's got enough assets, go and revisit that because he doesn't quite know the, the abilities of the people he's talking to. Um, people do sometimes get hung up with, you know, what if I'm asked to help with a search? Um, 
the, the Coast Guard will, will throw his best assets at the places of the most likelihood. So what happens is, you know, they, they start off with, whether it's a life raft or a person, whatever, they start off with, here's, here's the start point. Um, and then they go, what time was the person we think there? And they put a time in. And the computer very quickly generates a, um, a, a pattern that's colour-based. And the, the brighter the colour, the more probability it's there. And he then throws his best assets, in particular aircraft, at the areas of most probability. So if there was, and, and obviously as time progresses, the air probability expands. Um, and a person in the water um, will, will, will float, depending on their mass, weight, what they're wearing, etc. cetera. Um, so as time progresses, if he's got lots of assets, and, and, and us as leisure boaters, and I, I, that's the term for us, were to offer our assistance, we'd be put in the area of least likelihood where we had least chance of crashing into another asset. Um, but but I, I go back to my opinion, and this is not written down, but this is my opinion, is um, what I'm teaching my students is when they lose someone, how do they react until until on-the-scene command and, 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 and search and rescue take over with possibly more effective techniques? Uh, any, any other questions at all? Not actually a question, but um, if you saw Saving Lives at Sea last week, there was probably a good example when they were looking for a kite surfing kit uh, and they worked in conjunction with a helicopter to do this sort of search. Yeah, sorry, I didn't hear. Who, who was that? Um, on, on Saving Lives at Sea, I think it was last week, the RNLI programme. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, great. I mean, the, 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 the Coast Guard will use whatever asset they can get, but they're always going to favour the assets they, they know the most about. Um, okay, so, so now we're going to talk, um, I haven't got to slide this, but now we're going to talk about how we might teach this practically. Um, and it sounds like, um, like Gary has been teaching this practically quite a few times. So, so let's ask Gary, how do, you, how do you go about setting up the exercise? Well, I've, um, I've only ever done it as a box search. Um, and I, use, I actually use an orange to do the search with. Um, but I always conduct it at 10 second, uh, 10 second um, stages and 10 knots, because I find that's the easiest for people to concentrate. It's too much for them to take in. And to be fair, I've never thought about EDRs in the past. Um, and I just run a box search. And um, eight times out of 10, it's successful. And on the times it's not successful and we lose the orange, uh, it's a good learning point for the students that actually it's pretty damned hard to find things. Okay, brilliant. So, so I, I can see a lot of sense in keeping the numbers easy. And I can see Gary's approach of let's te teach the expanding square or expanding box because it's the easiest to get your head around. Um, let's have a quick look what clue we get from the R way as to what we might do. Well, Doug, what I would say is, having listened to what you've just said, um, I'm relatively tempted to start delving more into the sector searches. But that's, okay. uh, that's well, if, if you give me two minutes, I'll tell you how I run it, and then you can take that away and use it, or you can throw it in the bin. So we don't like Doug's idea, but I'll tell you how I run it in just a second. Just before we do that, um, let's. Uh, I don't like slides with lots of words, but this is a screenshot straight out of G19, the instructor handbook for power instructors. Um, and what does it tell us? It says the most effective pattern for a lone craft is an expanding box. Blah, 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 blah. It then says the sector search has been shown to be more accurate. Uh, that, that's a slight contradiction, isn't it? I, th I think that what they're saying here is, look, the sector search is, is more accurate. That's the one that's, that's better. But for a lone craft who's not been practicing loss, um, the expanding box is probably easier to, to get a hair out, which is exactly what, what Gary suggested and, and I would agree with. When these first came into the syllabus, um, we were asked to teach both. In fact, it was then called an expanding box. Um, and then a little while later, this one disappeared and we were asked to teach that one. And then it seems to have reappeared. Um, there isn't anything hard and fast. So, so you're going to get now my take on, on how to do this. So uh, first of all, I'm not nice, nice as Gary. I have a grey tennis ball, so it's a little bit harder than orange to find. Um, the, the difficult thing about a grey tennis ball is you can't buy them anymore. You, you have to give it to your dog and let your dog go and play with it and chew it and get it muddy for a little while and then rescue it before it gets popped. Um, I can't find a shop that sells anything other than aluminous, aluminous yellow tennis balls. But anyway, I've got my grey tennis ball, um, and 
in the classroom, I give the students a brief and it's shorter than the brief you guys have had. Um, and I ask a few questions in the usual teaching format. So we just kind of drum in what the corners are and so on. Uh, I then brief them for a second practical session. And the other practical session usually is something high speed navigation. It might be following a, following a contour at high speed, following some transit, something like that. <clears throat> I tend to do this on the second day of an advanced powerboat course. Uh, I put a damn boy on board because the, the, the rivers I'm teaching on don't tend to carry a damn boy. So I, so I add that piece of kit and we go out into whatever stretch of water I'm going to use. So for those who have the local geography I do of Southampton, <coughs> um, you can do this in Southampton water, but not on a flat, calm day. On a flat, calm day, you need to get out into the central solar and, 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 and get a tiny bit of sea state, even if it's only from passing vessels. Um, I then go out into the area and I, I do this search first. And I, in my head, um, have a picture of the chart, as I'm sure you all do, and I, I just drop that onto my chart with a very rough estimate in my head of what all the legs are going to be. And it, it's only very approximate. And I then say to myself, I want them to do that triangle, that triangle, and that third triangle. And I want them to find my grey tennis ball down here. I don't want to drag this out all day, but also don't want to find it straight away. So I then, um, I then I'll ask one of the students... Uh, I'll, I'll find a nice wiggly contour in the chart that goes like this. And I'll ask him to follow that at 15 knots or something. Um, and then I'll say to the next student, right, you jump on the helm and see that train to drive towards the transit. And the students will be thinking, this is a bit basic. What I'm actually doing is getting them to drive around a circle. And at some point I throw the tennis ball over. And I've told you where I throw it over. So if any of you ever come on a course with me, you know what's going to happen. Um, I throw the tennis ball over here. And a little while later, as we're about here, all in my head, I say, stop, stop, stop the boat. We've lost Mr. Tennis Ball. And it dawns upon them, oh yeah, we were told earlier how we were going to do this. And they go, oh, well, we've got a damn boy. And, and sometimes you've got to prompt them, sometimes they get on with it, but they chuck the damn boy in and they start the search pattern. So the things that make life easy for you, the first is, you know, don't be shy to have a quick few glances at the magnetic compass and make sure that where you lob this in is roughly where you want to end up. Um, and one way of making it very easy for yourself is you, you, you find a mark, I don't know, let's take a mark, Hillhead, and, and you just say to yourself, I'm going to use Hillhead, Hillhead as a start point. The students don't know that, but it just gives you the instructor visual reference because then you can work out when you're in the right place in relation to Hillhead, chuck your tennis ball over, set them a few things to do so they drive around for a bit, and then just say to them, go that way, and, and as they pass it, go, oh, we've lost, and, and they won't even acknowledge that Hillhead is your reference, but, but you've used it. The other thing you can do to make your life easy, of course, is when you chuck your tennis ball over, make sure you get a transit or, or two. Um, uh, you know, if the tide's going, if the tide's going eastwards, um, then you know, get a get get an east-west transit. Um, but if you can get two, it just means that after a little while progresses, if it's not quite working, you can see which way to steer it to to to, to make it work. So we go out and we perform this. And if we get around that third triangle and we haven't found the um, we haven't found the um, tennis ball, I start to question myself and my heart rate goes up a little bit. Like, oh, is this going to work? And we go around and do the second circuit, and invariably it does work. If, however, it hasn't, it's probably because I've estimated EDR wrong, um, and my tennis ball is actually outside of my circuit. So I get to move on to the expanding square. Now, here's the here's the facts for you. Um, I would estimate I've run this session a lot of times, 60, 70, 80 times. Um, and it's very good over the years. And in all the times we've done it, we've only ever once lost, well, it wasn't a tennis ball actually, but we only ever once lost the item. Um, and I used to be working at a center in Southampton and it was a dinghy center. And uh, I, I, lost, I hadn't lost the tennis ball at sea, I'd lost it ashore. So I was looking around the workshop for, to find something that floated and I cast my eye on this bag of ducks that I used to use with the Optimus sailors, the floating ducks that the kids had to go and chase. Um, so I picked up this yellow duck. And I thought that's too easy. So I got my black insulating tape and wrapped it up in, in black tape. So we now had a, we, we nicknamed it Ninja Duck. So we now had a, a black plastic duck. And, um, and it's quite a small one. And it's not the, not the big bath on it. It's a little small, little small one. And um, we went out and it was a bit of a last minute. Couldn't find the tennis ball, used this. And we chucked it in and we did the search as I've described and we found it. 
And I got back to the workshop, put the duck on the side and went around the next course six, seven weeks later, used the duck again and so on and so forth. And I'd been using the duck for a year or so and we ran a search in Southampton Water and, and we lost it. And um, it was a fairly benign day and the students were doing quite a good job and I was pretty gutted because one, I told them this always works and two, it didn't work and three, they'd done a really good job and it didn't work. Um, and uh, so that was the day that my statistic went from this always works to it, it hasn't worked today and I apologise to students and off we went. Now we're going to fast forward 10 years. A decade later, I was running an advanced power instructor course. There's six guys on the course. There's a father and son team. And I'm describing to them exactly what I've just described to you. And they, they start grinning and nudging each other. One of them says, you better tell him. And it turns out that 10 years previously, the, the son who was back then 12 or 13 and his dad had been out doing a dinghy race off Netley. And they'd seen this duck floating past and they'd picked it up. Um, and, and when he told me, I remembered that there'd been a dinghy race out in the middle of our search area and we'd had to slow down a bit for it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put that down to I hadn't actually lost my duck or tennis ball ever. Um, so so the summary from that is it, it, is it works, but you've got to manage it well. Um, another couple of tips for you. Um, when we get back to, when we get to the tennis ball, I tell them to treat it as a man overboard. And when we go back to pick up the damn boy, I tell them to treat that as a man overboard. So if we go out and do perhaps two sets of searches and explore, sometimes we only do two searches, but if we go out and do two searches, we've just done four man overboard pickup practices while we're at it. And it's all just reinforcing the, the same stuff they do um, back home. So every advanced power boat course I've ever taught, which is quite a few, I have always done these searches. Um, and I guess the reason for that is when I did my advanced power boat course, that's what my instructor did. So I've just kind of modeled on that. Um, my own course plan, it fits into day two quite nicely and I combine it with some other stuff. So we go out and do a few high speed stuff. Um, perhaps if someone's night nav didn't go well the day before, we might go out and, and, and um, uh, look for a cross on the chart or something just to reinforce what they, what they need to pick up from the day before. Um, and I quite often do it as the, as the, as the second half of the Sunday. It's almost the last thing we, we do because it's, if they've had a lot of number crunching and navigation and, and tidal heights and stuff, it's, it's a bit of a refreshing just driving fast and it's quite satisfying to, to find it. Okay, so there's, that's, that's my take on, um, on what we would be doing and how we might go about it. And I fully appreciate that the syllabus doesn't say we've got to do it practically. And in fact, this paragraph here gives us a little bit of wiggle room as to, as to where to go. But it, certainly if you were working at a centre I was running, I would be encouraging you to teach both um, and to do it practically. Um, but that's not to say that those that don't are doing it wrong because the, the advanced syllabus is a full syllabus, I get that. Um, and there's a lot of time to spend on stuff. Um, my take on this, and this is me speaking, not the other way, is that if I'm devoting half my advanced course to teaching man overboard and boat handling, I'm not doing good service for the students that are wrong with good skills already. They want to learn something new. Um, and that stuff is in the syllabus, but I, I like to give that a very brief look on the advanced. You know, if they come on an advanced and they, they're struggling with turning, they can find space, they're, they're possibly on the wrong course. Um, so I, I, I like to get this in there because it's something new they haven't covered elsewhere. Somebody earlier on mentioned the safety boat course. Um, uh, the safety boat course is a very full course. I would suggest that this would be a theory session on the safety boat course um, uh, rather uh, than a session. Matt here. Uh, I can't find it on the safety boat course and I stand to be corrected but I don't think it's there anymore. Oh, that's interesting. So let's... <laughs> I mean, you've been there. It's been a while since I've taught safety. Right, so I'm going to open the instructor handbook and I'm going to share that with you so we can all look at the same place. And then we all leave with the correct answer. Uh, so share screen. Uh, this is the R-Way book app. Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Thank you. I, I suspect half of you have got this and the other half... My advice would be to get it. The reason I mentioned safety boat was because it was taught on my course, but that was quite a few years ago. It definitely was in there as a theory element. Um, but let's have a look and see if, if it's gone or... 
they do sometimes make little small tweaks, don't they? And you'd sometimes, unless you're constantly referring back to the book, don't notice them. Um, lost it, where's... Along the top. And I'm after the logbook, because that's the definite syllabus. That's the one. Who would have thought of putting the power Scheme scheme logbook in the power section? <clears throat> so, in fact, we could probably do a search for pattern. That might be quicker. There we go. Matt is correct. It is not mentioned in the safety anymore. That's interesting. Okay, so it definitely was in the safety weight course as a theory, but um, it's obviously been reviewed and, and slid it out because it's probably not considered that appropriate when dinghy, I'm, I'm guessing now, when dinghy and windsurf centres are only operating within three miles of their um, of their start point. Okay, so we'll go back to the presentation. Thank you, Matt. Um, right, so now, uh, how are we doing for time? Has it got a clock on for me? 11 o'clock, Doug. Okay, thank you. Right, so what we've got now, we're, we're going to come back to search patterns in five or six minutes, and we're going to look at some other search patterns just to up your knowledge level, really. But before we do that, I, th I just found this on YouTube the day before yesterday, and I thought it was quite interesting. So it's a J97, uh, so that's a 10-metre um, racing yacht called Windjammer. Um, some of you may know the crew on board this, may know the boat. And this video was made in January 2019. Um, and uh, what happens is one of the crew falls overboard and they recover him, her, sorry, uh, reasonably successfully, actually. Um, so this session is not intended to rip apart the, um, the owner and the um, crew of Windjammer because they successfully got their crew person back fairly quickly. But I think it's probably quite useful for us to, to discuss what did they do well and what, what might they have done differently or better. Um, which is my polite way of saying um, what was what was bad. So I'm going to divide you into four groups now. So um, so this is a sail yacht, and some of you aren't sailors. So I'd like the sailors to look at the sail-specific stuff, and I'd like the power boaters to look at the stuff which is generic across all boats. So, for example, having a spotter pointing at a man overboard is generic to all boats, isn't it? But, the, the technique you use for dropping a sail is specific to sail. Um, so if we said uh, Pete Smith and David Walder, Simon, Paul Pearson, um, could you look please at what the sailors, what they do well as sailors? And then, and there's that one. Sail, 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 sail. And then, uh, so not Paul, take Paul out of that group. And then if Paul... Ross Butler, Ray Mitchell, another Paul. If you could, if you could think about, if that was your student, what would you like them to do differently? What might they do? Um, what might they do better from a sailing point of view? And then I've missed out Nikki, um, Gary, Matt. If you could have a think about, please, um, as a boater, what did they do good? What did you like? If you were giving them feedback, what would you compliment them on? And then that leaves um, Alex, Chris, and Nick. If you could have a think about, as a boater, what they might have done better. Um, if you miss which group you're in, don't stress too much. It's just, let's, let's see if we can get a few comments from us all afterwards. So I'll shut up and put the video on now. Trim on first, we'll go off with, then we'll talk, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do the top, and then you take over, okay? So get ready to trim up. Okay, ready to go? Okay, 
And then we're just going to trim off a little bit of off it. Okay, time to be ready. Ready, coming off. Okay, time to be ready.
Okay, so the, the man overboard pickups obviously happened. I'll just advance so you can see what happens afterwards. Helicopter arrived. Crew get back ashore and have a bit of a laugh and joke about it. So, um, uh, so that video is on YouTube. That's where I found it. I don't know the, the people involved, but yeah, any of you could download the same video. And there's a little write up there. But let's um, let's hear. We got any comments there? So let's talk first of all to the sailors. So don't pinch the boating specific boating stuff, sailing specific stuff. Anyone from that first group of of what did you like? What did they do good? The uh, skipper seemed to have uh, good leadership. Yeah, lots of communication, wasn't there? Lots of lots of talking with him. Good. Anything else? He seemed yeah. to be sailing away for a long time, and you could have just hove to, stopped the boat, dropped the jib on the foredeck. So, so let's just you're quite right. right. Let's just stick with the positive stuff. What do we like? Oh, yeah. They got back to the casualty relatively quickly. They did indeed. Was there anything we liked about from a sailing specific point of view? Depowering the jib quite early meant that the boat slowed down considerably quite early on as well. I know we talked about hove two, but actually just depowering, getting that jib down, lost boat speed and therefore distance quite quickly. Good. So, so you minimise the distance, so we're blasting away at six knots. Um, for the rest of the sailors among you, was there anything you would like to do different? If that was your student, you might debrief and do differently. There were a couple of things. I, I, I understand that to depowering the jib will slow the boat down, but I think, you know, there there should have been a crash tack because you're um, increasing the distance all the time between the mob and you. And a crash tack, one, it stops the boat, and two, it's pointing back the right the right way. The other two things I noted on that... David, you're... We'll just, David, we'll just come back to you. Just don't grab them all in case someone else has got some. OK. A second. Uh, but, yeah, I think there was a few nods there about the words crash tack and hope too. Any other thoughts from the sailors? Um, um, yeah, I mean, just just sorry, one comment on that. I mean, you know, whilst that was one of the first things that struck me, they did have one guy on the foredeck at the time. Um, as a racing crew, he'd have probably dealt with it if they'd have thrown attacking quickly, but they would have had to make sure he was safe um, because if he would end up on the wrong side of the head salon, which would now be the low side, that could have potentially been a second casualty. Um yeah, that was that was a, just an observation on the crash tack on that. Maybe yeah, maybe in, in hindsight, it was better to just drop it as they did. Do you think they needed to drop the main? Could they just have got rid of the jib and kept the main up, and then use the um, bow down approach because that would have made the side of the boat lower and made it easier to get the person on, possibly. I think that's a fair comment. I mean, they dropped the main and it worked, didn't it? But there's so many things that can go wrong during a main cell drop. I would have been inclined myself to leave the main up and and, and either get blown down sideways like we do on a motor cruise or, or come from a, a close reach downwind. Um, I'd have been inclined to leave that main up. Um, but to be fair, it worked, didn't it? 
any other comments from any of the sailors before we move on to the more generic non-sailing specific stuff? I think there's a huge potential for ropes in the water and getting around the prop. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, keeping the mainsail up is one less thing to worry about there, isn't it? Um, get those two jib sheets in. Uh, interestingly, you may not have realised this, the engine was on before the exercise started. So he'd, he'd gone out for a training session and, and in his own words, I kept the engine on just in case. Um, and that was proved to be a good strategy. Let's, let's throw the discussion to our, to our petrol and diesel head friends. Um, any, um, any comments on, well, let's first of all, what was good? What do we like? Uh, I thought the skipper was very calm um, and the spotting was was spot on. They were on it straight away. I thought they did a really good job with that. Um, just generally, it was quite well managed, I think, um, other than the May Day was, was considerably late. Other than that, I thought it was a good the job. The May Day yes. May went out at one minute and 30, so 90 seconds after. Yeah, so to oh. agree with Gary, I'd have probably um, raised May Day a bit earlier, had someone on that almost straight away. Um, so it's out there and, and potentially people are coming to help you. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. Any, anything else from anyone else? I think, I think, I think the, the, sorry. No, you go. Yeah, I, th I think the late May day, I think they got all the hands too trying to deal with the sails. If they'd stopped the boat, um, they would have had time to, to May day, then deal with the sails. I appreciate the position of the, the crew on the bow. As a cruising sailor, not a racing sailor, that hadn't drifted into my mind, but... Uh, They'd have had a bit more time to settle down and get their heads around what they were going to do next if they'd hove to. Um, but all the crew were handling sails in some way, shape or form. So could they have spared a crewman to go and put a maid out sooner or not is really what we're asking. And, and yeah. uh, it may be he didn't think of the May Day straight away and it came to him, you know, a minute later. Um, but uh, I, I, I would agree with a comment that that could have happened earlier and a hove to would have helped that, wouldn't it? Um, any other comments from our from from the, the non sale specific stuff? Yeah, I, the comment I was going to make um, was that it would have been quite quick to be able to po push the mob button because that looks like a Ray Marine bit of kit on his bulkhead, and um, got that. And, and along with that, um, you know, to throw in the Dan boy. Yeah, that was definitely. Was I mean, I'm surprised that the spotter didn't lose sight of it. Because of the, you know, they'd gone for about two minutes before they decided to turn, doing six knots. You do the sums on that in terms of how far away they were, and it was blowing about a false five. So someone's going to be difficult to see. Yeah, I agree. I think to, to me, that's a non-negotiable. That's not a discussion. That is a you should have thrown some man overboard gear after that person to make them more visible, give them something to float from. Um, so that would be in my. That would be on my, my cross list. Definitely, a, you know, something to pick up on. Um, any other comments from um, from that fourth group? I don't think we've heard much from yet, have we? It was Alex, Chris, Nick and Matt. I think the method of recovery was um, a little bit dubious. I'd have brought them to the lower side. I think, obviously, if we were talking about drifting down and using the sail, we would have had to lower that side. But I'd have brought them back to the cockpit to recover yeah. rather than trying to bring them up on the bow. I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, that, that pick up on the bow is so much more difficult because of the height. I think, um, to, be, to be fair, I think they were midships, weren't they? Um, of course, the danger on the very bow or the stern is that the boat gets picked up on a wave and slammed on the head. Um, somewhere in that shrouds midship section, the boat can't get picked up because it doesn't have a... It, it goes down to a keel. It doesn't have something to... to, to, to to smack you so um i'm not going to say i disagree but i i think the point to pick up from my point of view i, I wouldn't pick up on that one i quite like maybe that. it was a camera angle it, it did look quite a long way from, but maybe a little bit further back yeah maybe okay maybe a little bit further back also, the wind direction and um you know the, the way the waves were kind of breaking it looked to me like it was you know a downwind pickup so he, he set the boat up, upwind. You may have heard him say, I'm going to come to windward. Um, and he had the boat blowing sideways down towards the casualty, I think. That was my interpretation. So not something we normally do, on a, not something I've seen many yacht masters and instructor candidates do on a, on a sailboat, but it, it worked, didn't it? Um, I mean, he got the man back or the lady back. Yeah, yeah. 
and you could say reasonable treatment of the casualty afterwards, really. Uh, got them down yeah. below. I mean, I've, I've watched the video four times now. I'll, I'll just give you a few comments I came up with. Um, the, the crew are evidently all youngsters that have come out of the dinghy world and they're hot shot um, dinghy sailors and, and, and they're, they're great crew on a race boat because you can throw anything at them and they put up with it. Um, it'd be nice if you'd throw some life jackets at them. There's a lot of buoyancy aids there mm -hmm. uh, to go out in January in 35, and I know it's 35 to 40 knots because that's in his report, 35 to 40 knots of breeze and a buoyancy aid. Um, you probably saw when that girl was recovered, she was already wasn't fully conscious. She wasn't able to look after herself. They were dragging around the boat. In actual fact, they dragged a buoyancy seat off her just trying to pull her around the boat. Um, so fair play to them for being alongside in just under four minutes and having her on board in just over another minute. But I, I think that to me was a good example of where they should have been wearing decent life jackets. Um, and clothing in general, all of all the crew apart from one looked to me like they're wearing trainers. And there's one there in a picture. Um, and I know it looks quite a sunny day, but it's 35 to 40 knots in January. Um, and uh, I, I think the skipper should be providing life jackets as part of the boat and recommending the crew wear some wellies or something something better. Did anyone notice what happened to the jib when it was being dropped? Yeah, it went over the side. Let's see if we can get a picture of it. Yeah. So what happened here was the second they started dropping the jib, it popped out the tough luff. Uh, apologies to the power batteries, that doesn't make any sense, but there's a groove up here, the jib is hoisted up, and if they're abused over time, the, the groove opens up, and if you take the head cell, the, the halyard tension off, it pops out. Um, interestingly, that was a known fault, so they went out that day knowing that was a fault, and it didn't cause them a massive problem, but you could just imagine, engines running, person in the water, someone's already mentioned it, you can just imagine how easy we end up with a bit of sail or halyard around the, around the prop. Um, so that would be, to me, a clue to to get that repaired before you... If something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong in cold weather in windy conditions, isn't it? Um, if they hove two, it probably wouldn't have happened. I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, the hove two might have solved that. Interesting in his comments, he also said that he kept the engine running, not just, just in case, but um, also because it, it wasn't that, that in that good working order. I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't know if that means he wasn't sure if he switched off, it would start it again, but... Um, yeah, something else just to keep an eye on. Um, one of the clips I noticed near the beginning, I can find it. I don't want to dwell too much of this because it's a little bit off topic from search patterns. I think the guardrails looked a bit loose to me when I saw it in. You'll have to take my word for it. The guardrails did look a bit loose. Um, good, okay. So uh, I just, um, I was actually looking for a video on search patterns and I couldn't find one. I found that. So I thought I'd show you that instead. But um, let's get back to our, our core subject, shall we? Um, so we've looked at two datum searches. And datum searches have a reference point, a single start point, which is what we talked about, whether it's a digital datum or a visual datum and the pros and cons of each. And that for that sector search, even if you start with a digital datum, you put a visual datum in to, to start your search from. We're now going to look at area searches. And for the vast majority of you, I'd suggest you're not going to teach these because these are uh, tricks that are used by search and rescue uh, authorities, such as the RNLI, um, where they search a specific area. So the Coast Guard is tasked, I want you to look between A, B, C, and D. Um, the datum searches we've looked at already, for those, you work off magnetic compass because you and the datum and the man are all moving in the water together. An area search, we work over course over the ground. So there's a, a, a big difference there. The datum searches that I'd suggest you teach, the two we've looked at, are uh, speed through the water and magnetic compass. Area searches are speed over the ground and course over the ground. So these can be drawn very much over a chart, and as time progresses, wouldn't move an area. So um, there's a number of uh, area searches, and the first... The most common are known as parallel sweeps, and there's two sorts of parallel sweep. On the left, we've got the creeping line ahead. On the right, we've got the parallel track. So what's, what's relevant? So Coast Guard has allocated a search area, and that is A, B, C, D. There may be another craft who's got A, B, C, D right next to you, um, but, but that's your area. Uh, CSP, this is, the, this is the start point, so commence search point. Um, and 
The difference between the parallel track and the creeping line ahead is very subtle. The parallel track does the long edge first. The creeping line does the short edge first. Other than that, they're the same. Um, so uh, he's gone down. So let's put some terminology on it now. So that distance there is half a track space, isn't it? So he's gone down here. And when he's approaching the line BC, half a track space before he's turned. He's gone one track space and turned. And then if you look at line AD, half a track space before that is turned. Half a track space, of course, is what I call EDR in my world of not having a computer. But if you were on an all-weather lifeboat, this is, pro this is programmed into their, into their navigation gear. So the Coast Guard says A, B, C, D, um, and this is your track space, and, and, the, and the computer draws that out over the plotter, and then they follow it um, with no allowance for wind or tide. They follow over the seabed, if that makes sense. So those are parallel sweeps. Um, and uh, I did used to, a long time ago, talk about this one here on the Advanced Powerboat course, um, but I, 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 I binned it quite some time ago because it was just too much to, it became too big a session to, to deal with. Next one we're going to look at is the goalkeeper. So um, so this is this is a perfect example of an area search because the, the, the guy's falling off the bridge here. Well, there's the current. So we, we know he's not up tide of the bridge, don't we? So that's fairly obvious. And we know he's not, we think he's not on the land. So you've got a very defined area. And in actual fact, um, the land has defined the area for us. So he's dropped off there. They've worked out sometime in the next 15, 20 minutes, he's going to go past this point. And all the goalkeeper does is, is dive back and forth. So let's show you that. Here's the area, little blue dotted line. So it's, it's literally defending the goal. And if this was a big goal, you might have someone defending that bit and someone else defending that bit. Um, it would depend on what EDR or what track space is, wouldn't it? Next one we're going to talk about is the shoreline search. Um, so imagine um, uh, this is the search craft and it's going to keep itself equal distance from the shore. So, uh, and you, you, could, you could have a succession. You could have another boat out here a further distance off. So let's say this is a small craft. Um, the Coast Guard has asked you to search half a mile offshore. If you're, say this was cliffs, if you're fitted with radar, this will be very easy to use a radar to keep that distance. But if not, you do some other navigation tricks. Um, and you're following uh, the coastline, aren't you, essentially? And as I say, there may be another boat further off. And this distance would be determined by, by EDR, wouldn't it, or by track space, by the, by the distance you could see. Um, it may be there's a team actually working on the shoreline itself. So it may be they, they visually see the first bit and you see the second bit and the bit after. And as I said, if there's another vessel, it could be it could be going up here. So that's a shoreline search, typically used when someone's disappeared from a beach, a surf or something like that. Uh, this is the track line. There are two sorts of track line. Um, there's the non-return, and you can probably guess the one's called the return or the single leg, or the double leg, twin leg. So when would this get used? So, so imagine, imagine there's no tide whatsoever, there's no current, and the ferry has gone from B to A. And when the ferry gets to A and they go to um, disembark all the passengers, someone hasn't come back down to his car. So they go, oh dear, we've, we've got a passenger unaccounted for, we've lost a passenger on the way. Well, they know that assuming the passenger's not you know, hid himself in the injury or something, they know, they know the passenger's fallen off on that route. So a track line search just simply goes back down that route. Um, so we know where the boat, the casualties come off has been, we're gonna go back down the same route. So that's a single leg track line. This is a track line return. So that's the route we think the casualty is most likely on, but we accept he can have drifted off one side or other. So we're actually gonna offset slightly. So this is track space here, isn't it? So EDR in Doug's world, track space in the RNLI's world. Um, and we just offset, so cleverly onto land, we've just off, offset slightly and come down one side of the, um, and, and then the other. Um, and, uh, you know, if a, if a search and rescue asset was deployed to do that, he would report back into command at that stage and say, you know, I've done that, what do you want me to do next? Um, and he might get allocated something new, or he you know, might be said, okay, there is a little bit of current that's going to do a goalkeeper down here. Um, we may be asked to repeat that. Or, or they may have said, well, maybe he didn't pull over the water. We don't, we don't know. Um, and then the last search I'm going to mention, so these are all quite quick, because as I said, I don't think you're teaching these. These are more just for your awareness. Um, this one I call the quadrant search, and it is, in fact, um, 
a bit like a creeping line ahead. Uh, it's sometimes known as an oil rig search because that's where it's used. So I'd like you to not have wind and tide, just picture one or other. So let's say there's some tide. Chap's fallen off the, off the rig. Obviously, we need to make sure he's not clinging onto something down here. Um, well, we know he's not gone up tide, so you very quickly, you very quickly draw, um, uh, draw these four quadrants. So, um, uh, right going that way, that gives me two. Those are the two lines important, and I'm just going to come down tide, um, going from side to side as I go. Uh, so a number of years ago, I did a bit of work with a, with a wind farm up on the East Coast, and this was exactly what we trained their guys to do. Um, if, uh, so they'd drop a man onto a, onto a wind turbine, and they'd go off to another wind tower, and drop, they'd, they'd drop off six guys. Um, and if they felt someone had fallen off a wind turbine, they would draw this out on their chart, and we used to identify transit. So they'd, they'd pick the – I mean, the tide there only went two directions, obviously, up and down the coast um, – so you'd look up here and you go, that's my wind turbine in question. There's my transit. So, so that gives you that line. So as you're, you're coming down, you, you've got something to hit. Um, and it might be we sit over here and we look at that one and we could see a transit on the shore. And, and, and we just used rough transits, you know, whatever, whatever was close. That particular wind farm was close enough to the, to the shore we could pick up transits. Um, that was also 20 years ago. I would say the technology and chart plotters now you, you could quite easily have the technology to do this for you rather than have to, to, to worry about transits. So that I think pretty much wraps up what I'd like to cover. So before I come back to you for a, for a quick quiz, um, any questions at all? Yeah, Doug, could you go back to the slide of the creeping line search and the, the parallel search? Because I, I might be missing something here, but it looks to me that if you turn the creeping line search through 90 degrees, it's, it's doing the same thing as the parallel. It, 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 you're exactly right. The orientation. So basically the same search. The difference is the parallel track takes the long edge, AB first. The creeping line takes the short edge, AD first. And oh, I, I, right, okay. That's pennies yeah. dropped now. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, that's a really good question, actually. Well spotted. Um, let's uh, let's just identify why they might use one or other. So there's there's two reasons. The first is if there's more likelihood of the casualty being in this area, there's no point wasting a lot of time going up and down here, is there? So the Coast Guard looks at the highest probability of where the casualty is and, and deploys the asset to that bit first. So that might dictate. To, so although you've been given A, B, C, D, they think that you know A, D is the most likely end. So let's do that first. Okay, he's not there. Let's go and do the rest. The other reason is conditions. We all know that it's quite easy to keep your course when you're going downwind, don't we? Forget saving here, just, just under power. It's also fairly easy to keep a course going upwind. It's hardest when you're going across the wind. So if, let's say, we had a southerly wind and they set you off on this one, you're spending a lot of time trying to combat leeway. Well, it could be tide, couldn't it? A lot of time... So they might set you off on this one because you spend more time going into and downwind and less time crosswind. So there's, there's two different reasons why they might jump from one to the other. But I should emphasize, if you were involved in this stuff, the Coast Guard is coordinating, or, you know, unless it's a long way offshore, but even then probably the Coast Guard's coordinating. So HM Coast Guard's coordinating. They're dictating where A, B, C and D are. They're telling you what search to do and they're telling you what the track space is. So, so you almost go into... To, to robot mode and this is where you know the, I, i'm not sure about the inshore lifeboats but certainly the all-weather lifeboats i think probably inshore lifeboats as well the atlantics have got this software in them um so the information is sent to them and it, and, it, and it tells them where to search yeah they've all all the boats are now equipped with sims so all are capable of doing this was that uh was that simon was it it was yes thank you simon great um any other questions at all yeah, I'd just take it from that, uh, the, the fact that the one's rectangular, one's square. Is that just a visual representation? Because I had the same question about the long and the short bit. So, so it's just meant to be two rectangles. Yeah, I, I, this is, I, I'm not going to blame the author because I've pinched the diagram from someone else, so I can't slag them. But but yeah, if you could imagine AB is longer, um, so they're both rectangles. The point is, this one uses the long edge. It doesn't demonstrate very well in the picture. This one uses the short edge first. 
Yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I might see if I can do some jiggy poke with that before the next one and make that one a bit longer. Cool. I think referring them to them as the long leg search and the short leg search kind of defines it. David, if, if, if I was in charge of naming, that's what they'd be, yes. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, what we're going to do now is get a bit of interaction. Um, so let me stop sharing that with you and start sharing this with you. So we're going to do something called Kahoot. Uh, I'm sure some of you will have played this before. Um, how does it work? You're going to need your smartphone. So first of all, if you're already using your smartphone, I apologize, you're going, to, you're going to have to do this a little bit differently. But for those of you that have got device number one, which you've got me on at the moment, and you've got a smartphone as well, um, I'll explain what we're going to do. So uh, pick up your smartphone and go to kahoot.it. So that's that address there. So don't Google it. I'll give you a different address. Kahoot.it. If you don't have a smartphone, you can just do this on a piece of paper. Um, when you've gone to that address, there's your PIN number. Hang on, I'm in trouble here. God's sake. I'm just going to excuse myself one second while you guys are logging in. Right, so we've got Nick, we've got Gary, we've got Pete. Three out of 15, we've got Nicky. Sorry, I've got to do it on paper. My smartphone's got an issue. Okay, on smartphone. One, two, three. Oh, what am I doing? Quick thumbs up if you've used Kahoot before. No. All some virgin kahooters. It's 10 of you logged in. Have we got any more logging in? We'll, we'll wait if you're still logging in. Just shout. Yeah, try. Sorry, Doug. I said, no, no, no rush. I just didn't do it if we didn't need to. I don't understand. My phone's not playing the game. Um, it's probably me. User error, I should think. Okay, so Paul, you need to go to kahoot.it. So, so don't Google it. You'll get a different address. Yeah, I've got kahoot.it. And then it should ask you for your game pin. I'm just getting a blank screen. It's uh, My phone's a bit funny. I've just had it. Well, grab, grab, grab yourself a pen and paper. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, I've got um, yeah. So what will happen is the guys on the guys who are logged in on their phones will see their scores. Um, we're only going to look at the top ones. We're not going to embarrass anyone if they become last. We, we'll know. We'll know. <laughs> um, uh, but if you if you haven't got access to a smartphone, you can still write write on a piece of paper. So what I happens? I find on as Gary Martin anyway. So if I come last, it'll uh... <laughs> okay. Um, if you uh, so what happens is the question comes up on the screen. So if the question said, "What did Doug have for breakfast?" It'll give you four options. Um, uh, a might be blue eggs. Um, B might be green cereal. C might be um, red uh, uh, toast. And D might be yellow, all of the above. And you go, yeah, Doug's a fat git. Yeah, all above, it's D. You answer, so you read the question on my screen and you hit the answer on your screen. And your screen, you don't have any answers yet, there's no question. Um, and it's, it's fastest fingers on the buzzers. So you get points for getting it right. You get more points for getting it right quicker. So let's, let's crack on. So first question. Which factor most differentiates a datum search from an area search? Seconds left. 
Good, so a, a datum search, that's the first two we looked at, that's the sector search and the expanding uh, square. Uh, it uses magnetic compass, so well done to those that got blue. Um, the area searches are the ones that use these GPS derived or land based, seabed based um, uh, factors. So, Tony, you got it right. That's a good, that means someone was listening. And uh, oh, look at David, early lead. Peter, only two points behind. Well done, Gary, Mac, and Paul. And well done, everyone else who's only just behind that. Uh, on to question number two. So, we get the answer to the idea how it works now. EDR is. And uh, 10 right again, EDR stands for expected detection range. Um, but I just want to emphasize, don't go away here from saying Doug says the R way says you've got to teach this. This is how Doug works it. Um, there are other bodies using other terms, aren't there? On to, oh, so well done. Uh, well done, Gary, taking the first lead, taking that lead. Dave is only just behind. Mac, Alex and Paul, well done. Um, arrow up means you're moving up the rankings, a bit like top of the pops. Question number three, on a sector search, leg length is. Oh, what a split of answers. So I would suggest that we use EDR to determine our leg length and I'm marking. And I would suggest that we use three EDR, don't we? So three times EDR makes the leg length, which would make, because I'm marking, none of the above the right answer. However, if you were trained by uh, one of the lifeboat organizations, you would be very forgiven for saying track space, because that's probably what you would have been taught. Um, sweet width, of course, is the same as track space, but that's not what we're derived from. So they've all got a bit of rightness to them, but I'm going for none of the above, the green one. So that's reorder the table slightly on to question number four. 50-50 oh, on this one. And it would appear that eight of you are either lucky or were listening. Um, uh, the advanced COC syllabus specifically mentions the sector search. It doesn't mention the expanding square. Sorry, it looks like five of you were lucky. Apologies. How can you have so many unlucky people? Um, so Nikki's moved up. Paul's moved up. Max still holding top spot. Uh, only four questions left. Search patterns are contained in the advanced power syllabus as... Good, well done to the eight of you. It was an understands. Um, and to be honest with you, the advanced power course is really the place that we're teaching this stuff. And that's the place where I think there's time to do it practically. There's nothing wrong with, with covering it with yacht masters and, and other courses, but it's, it's not specifically in their syllabus. Uh, right, well done, Mac. Nikki, you're gonna have to go quite fast to catch up with him and grab that first place. And, and you three are gonna have to go quite fast to move up as well. Uh, on to question number six. Which volume of I am Sar manual details international search and profiles? Uh, it is, of course, volume three. Um, a question I have been asked previously is, is how to pronounce this. And it is literally, I am SAR. I am Search and Rescue is the pronunciation. Well, Nikki's dropped. Still on the table, eh? Well done, Mac. Mac is actually okay. doing very well. So come on, guys. Let's see if we can um, speed up the answering. Third last question. All turns on a sector search are... Of course, 120 degrees to start on the sector search. We're gonna we're gonna assume you guys just pressed the wrong button. You didn't know that really. Um, 
the expanding square would be 90 degrees, wouldn't it? And the sector search second round would be 30 degrees off, but the turns are 120 to start with. And um, Mac is clearly ahead now, and Pete's quite a long way into second place as well. Second last question, a damn boy horseshoe drove is required to... Drogue is there to stop the drift caused by wind, isn't it? We want the whole thing to move with the tide or, or current, don't we? Because that's what your man's going to be doing, but we don't want it blown across the surface because a, a human being isn't. And small little change there. On to, I think, one of the last question. On to the last question, question nine. Select the correct order. question, eh? Who wrote that? Um, so we went out of time for a couple of there. Of course, this is the sector search, isn't it? So we locate the datum, we head north to establish EDR, we then treble EDR. Um, so that one took a bit of reading. So well done for those six. And on to the final results on the podium, third place, well played Alex. Well played Pete. And that means, not surprisingly, So as I said, I, we're not going to worry about who came fourth or fifth or anywhere else. We're not here to, um, to do any assessment. Um, so that pretty much wraps up my session for you guys, um, which is good because I've got someone arriving at the door by the sounds of it. Um, uh, so but before we wrap up, any questions at all on anything we've talked about um, or, or any thoughts of something you think I should do differently or cover for this afternoon's group? I thought I thought it was really good, Doug. Thank you very much. There's uh, been I've got a lot from that, mate. I wasn't expecting so much, to be honest. So thank you very much. That, that, that's nice feedback. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Doug, for taking time out of your day to and well prepare it as well. It was great. Thank you very much. We well, uh, Nikki, I think likewise. Nick thank you, Doug. Let's hope it never happens, but uh, if it does, uh, thanks very much for uh, for your input. I think the thanks really needs to go to to Steve. Nikki's other half who dreamt this up and Nikki and Steve who've, who've done all the admin to put it together. All I've done is log in for two hours and, and, and talk and I'm, I, I quite like talking. Um, so <laughs> thanks to, thanks to Nikki and Steve for really, uh, it's quite boring collecting and collating addresses and grouping people and moving people who've changed their mind, isn't it? So thank you to, um, thank you to them. Um, guys, I'm going to just stay online for a minute or two in case anyone's got any questions for me not relating to what we've talked about. But other than that, let's say goodbye. And um, I look forward to seeing you all um, either at next year's conference for a beer or on the water before then. Um, obviously, this year's conference is not going to be face-to-face, -face, is it? No. Uh, Doug, Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you very much, Doug. That was brilliant. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Thanks very much, Doug. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.